Thank you. I'd like to thank Alberta Centre for Child, Family and Community Research for managing this talk and the, for the funding provided by Alberta Education. I am funded by the Alberta Centre for Child, Family and Community Research. I'm funded by CIHR. I'm also funded by Research Manitoba. However, I have no other conflicts to declare. I'd like to acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory, home of the Cree, Blackfoot, uh, homeland of the Métis, the Anishinaabe and Sioux communities. I come to you from Treaty 1 territory. Treaty 1 is homeland to the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dene, and Dakota people, as well as the homeland of the Métis Nation. I'd like to start today by talking about a whole school approach. Um, and whole school approaches, uh, in addition to my area of research, which is diabetes prevention and management, uh, involve a multitude of things. It's not just one single factor that's going to enhance school learning or school growth. Uh, it's multitudes of things. And so we like to use, uh, I come from the plains, I come from the flood plains in Manitoba. So I like to use the analogy of uh, sandbags and building a dike. And so when we talk about healthy school communities or promoting health or education in schools, um, rather than sell one sandbag, it's going to take multiple sandbags for us to accomplish this feat. And today I will present a novel sandbag that I hope you'll be able to adopt and implement into your schools. Um, but this should be implemented in the context of larger uh, interventions or other interventions to uh, build up that dike. And with that, as a community and as a, an entire school approach, we can work together to uh, enhance healthy school communities. I'd also like to uh, take the time to say that a lot of the things that we're currently doing right now, we think are novel, we think are good. Um, and 10 years from now, we might not think that. This is one of my favorite pictures from the Tour de France. I'm a really avid cyclist, and I love paying attention to what's happen happening in the Tour. Um, this is a picture of one man helping another cyclist light up a cigarette. The other guy already has a cigarette in his mouth. Why are they doing that? Because in 1910, we thought that if you had a smoke before you hit the hills, um, it would open up your lungs, and you'd be able to cycle faster. You'd do better. And right now, people in the room are laughing because uh, we know that that's fairly ridiculous. And so... Throughout this talk, I want you to think about what we're currently doing within our schools that may seem ridiculous to ourselves or other people 10 years from now when we reflect on it. And one of those things that I think is near and dear to my heart would be uh, the president's fitness test. So when I was a kid, our physical education class was uh, quantified based on how many chin-ups I could do, how fast I could do a shuttle run test, and whether or not I could do a mile. And I don't, a mile run in under six minutes. And I don't think that that kind of test was preparing me to be a physically active adult. And so when we look back on those things, they may have seen like the way to address poor fitness and childhood obesity at the time, but now we know that it's not. Um, so in terms of a whole school approach, I want to give you an example of a healthy whole school approach where scientists in the U.S. tried to come up with a strategy that was going to reduce rates of obesity and hopefully improve diabetes risk factors in some high-risk communities. This was a study published in 2010 in the prestigious journal, New England Journal of Medicine, and it was called the Healthy Trial. And so they gave these scientists $25 million to develop a healthy school curriculum that would significantly reduce rates of overweight and obesity, which we know are a major, major public health concern in our children today. So they developed specific classroom lesson plans for teachers to deliver that would say, this is what a healthy lifestyle looks for my children. They delivered family newsletters. They engaged families in the intervention. They had a summer break challenge so that all the learning that happened during the school year was continued throughout the summer. They had a health promotion coordinator in every school. Um, they had tracking and self-monitoring of kids. So, for example, right now we would say Fitbits or uh, different apps that you could use to track what you were eating. So all the kids pr were provided with those. They actually changed the foods in the school. They improved the quality of the phys ed. They provided the phys ed teacher with support, um, and then they delivered this for over three years. They studied high-risk students, so the majority, 50% of the school was overweight or obese. The majority were uh, coming from families where there was low high school graduation uh, among their parents. The majority were ethnic minorities. Uh, the family history, um, a lot of the parents already had diabetes at a young age. Uh, they delivered this in 6,000 uh, 6, students across 42 schools uh, in multiple states. And like I said before, they delivered this between grades 6 and 8. So this is like the ideal gold standard intervention that we would do. 
In terms of nutrition, they had $9,000 spread over three years to do a food service uh, overhaul of their cafeteria. They had hands-on monitoring by a dietitian. They provided the cafeteria with $175 per year to support training for the manager. The workers received $75 for preparing healthier foods. Every semester had a new theme around healthy foods, and students actually had one to two taste tests per year. The total cost, $1 million per year spread across those schools. In terms of physical activity, $15,000 over three years in new equipment. Uh, they had new lesson plans for the teachers. The teacher uh, was given training on how to deliver the intervention and paid for that. Reimbursed for six hour training sessions on how to deliver more active programming in the classroom. Booster sessions halfway through the year and then some money to collect data. $1.5 million spread out over 42 schools. So huge investment. Promotion all over the school. So in terms of healthy school or whole school approaches, we've affected the cafeteria, we've affected the classroom, we brought parents in. Now we have labels up all over the school. The not so sweet truth about sugar, nutrition labels, how to read them. Um, the importance of ha choosing water over pop. And so what did they find? Like I said at the beginning, 50% of the, the students that were involved in this study were overweight or obese at the beginning. They randomized them to that intervention or just to regular classroom uh, knowledge and activities. And what do you think happened three years later? 49%. So there was a 1% reduction in the rates of overweight and obesity based on a $25 million intervention. And so what's going wrong? Why are we not engaging kids in this, in this, uh, uh, in this kind of intervention? And so. In my opinion, we're focusing far too much on just knowledge, on providing students with just the knowledge on how to be healthier and how to live a more healthy lifestyle. And so, do you believe that knowledge is power? Because if you did, there wouldn't be a $25 billion industry like Jenny Craig or whatever this thing is to at SlimFast, Nutrisystem, Weight Watchers to get people to lose weight if knowledge was just enough. And so, I'd like to argue that what we're doing for kids in terms of creating a school system that pr promotes uh, whole school wellness, that just providing the knowledge to kids is, that, is not going to work. So you might be asking, what's this guy talking about? Um, and so let's consider some of the social determinants of health that not only affect graduation rates and kids staying in school, but also affect their health in schools. So if we take a look at um, this slide here, we've got diabetes and obesity rates in the entire US population stratified over the median income within each of those communities. So on the one axis, you can see it goes from one to five. So one would be the most wealthy community, five would be the most poor community. And you can see that rates of overweight, of obesity and diabetes, increase as those communities become more poor. If we take a look at just our adolescents, um, this is a little bit of a complicated graph, but it re reflects the impact of poverty and social determinants of health on the health of children. So in 1971 and 1974, rates of overweight and obesity were around 5% in teenagers. And the dark blue represents the more affluent kids, the light blue represents the less affluent or the more poor kids. This is a national survey, so it represents the entire population in the US. By 76, rates of overweight nudged a little bit over 5% in the poor youth and hovered a little under 5% in the less poor youth. And look what happened in 1988. Rates of overweight skyrocketed uh, around three and a half fold in the poor households, but only increased around 1.5 fold in the affluent households. And by 2004, we're seeing over rates of overweight and obesity hovering around 22% in the poor households, but just under 16%. So these are social determinants of health. These are inequities in our society, and those inequities are leading to health disparities in our kids. Here's some data from Manitoba showing the same thing. On the top graph, we have readiness for grade one. On the bottom graph, we have completion rates of grade 12. Don't worry about what each of those quintiles represents, but the gray bars are kids living in housing. The white bars are kids not living in housing. So you can see that the gray bars on the top, 50% of kids who live in housing are not ready for grade one. And in terms of completion rates for grade 12, high school completion rates, in the gray bars, in the worst parts of Winnipeg, where kids are living in housing, only 30% of those kids are completing grade 12, and at most 60%. And you can see that the difference between the light bars and the gray bars is huge. So affluent kids are ready for school, 
when they hit grade one, and they're more likely to graduate by the time they hit grade 12, but the more poor households, kids are not prepared, and they're not getting through to grade 12. So what can we do about that? Now, importantly, we have to acknowledge, especially in this era of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, that not only are our social determinants of health driven by poverty and um, other factors, but within our indigenous youth, they're still suffering from the legacies of residential schools. They're suffering from the legacies of government-sponsored loss of language, um, federal-sponsored loss of culture, and um, loss of land. And so these things are compounded within our indigenous communities and our indigenous youth, and they're still suffering from these things. And so one of the messages I want to deliver in terms of a whole school approach when working with our indigenous schools and our indigenous students is acknowledging the residential school activities and developing resources and tools so students can deal with that. Returning language to schools, returning culture to schools, and bringing students back onto the land. So in terms of our whole school approach, again, we can't just focus on knowledge. We have to focus on overcoming some of this adversity. So one of the analogies I like to use is if we just provide knowledge, it's like taking a group of kids, giving them a hockey stick, a hockey stick skates in a puck and saying, go play hockey, but never providing them with the ice on which to skate. And so for a whole school approach, I think we need to start with the ice before we start handing out the sticks and the puck, which I think is the knowledge. So where do we start? There are many places we can start, but I think in terms of creating a school uh, that is grounded in a whole school approach to overcome the social determinants of health, we have to start with something that, uh, a concept called resilience. And this is a nice picture of resilience where you see a flower blooming from um, a desert and it is reflecting uh, succeeding in the face of adversity. And so there's a really nice uh, document uh, that's on the website at Harvard called The Developing Child. And it goes through what resilience is and how resilience is important within schools and what teachers and parents can do to support resilience. So here we have uh, a balance. We have a child labeled in blue. We have positive outcomes on the right, negative outcomes on the left, and you can see that the positive outweighs the negative. And so in a healthy child development within the school, you're creating a positive school environment that tries to buffer some of the negative factors that the kids are exposed to. Early in life, if a child is exposed to poverty and different social determinants of health, not only do we see more negative outcomes sliding to the left, we see that the axis shifts over to the right so that some youth are more sensitive to the negative outcomes. So they might not only be higher, but they're also more detrimental because the, the student in this case hasn't maybe had that serve and return with a parent or with a caregiver or with a teacher um, that could help them overcome some of the negative things. And so our job is to shift that fulcrum to the left. So knowing that a lot of these youth are suffering from the negative things, we want to create a whole school environment where that fulcrum is shift so that they're better able to overcome that. In addition, we need to provide as many positive outcomes for youth as possible. And that is my concept of resilience. So what makes a resilient child? Someone that looks to them to provide a sense of belonging. So in this case, we have a teacher. It could be someone at home. It could be a friend. It could be a cousin. It could be uh, a sports team. Someone that gives that child a sense that they belong to a community, that they belong to something special. And I think that's a really important part of a whole school approach to uh, promoting wellness. The second thing would be mastery. So providing youth with an opportunity to master a skill, to master even mathematics or English. Something that they can feel competent in and that we can accentuate and, and, and celebrate when they're able to accomplish those things. Uh, the fourth thing would be self-regulation and independence, so the child's ability to make choices within the classroom. There are a lot of really nice social and emotional tools right now where students can take a look at where they are emotionally and then have the decision and independence to go red light, yellow light, green light, and say, here's where my emotions are and here's how I want to deal with it. And then finally, um, culture. Culture and religion are major, major sources of resilience. And so within the whole school approach, our argument is we need to build some of these factors in so that we can see better educational outcomes in our kids. So the model of uh, resilience that I would like to promote and that uh, we promoted this year at uh, the Shaping the Future conference, which was held by Everactive Schools, we invited Dr. Martin Brokenleg, who is um, an Indigenous scholar who's in Canada but comes from uh, Sioux Territory in South Dakota. 
And their model of resilience focuses on these four elements. So the first one, similar to what we described before, is belonging. So creating a sense in the school that children belong to something special. Because we know that a lot of our youth, whether they're living in poverty or whether they have overweight and obesity or a chronic condition, one of their major concerns is feeling isolated from the school, isolated from the family. So what can you do in your school to promote a sense of belonging? Number two, sense of mastery. How can you develop programs in your school that allow kids to master, children to master a skill and to showcase that mastery? Providing them with the independence for the programs that they want to deliver. And then the other one that wasn't in the previous slide is generosity. So giving youth an opportunity to give back to their community, give back to their school, really empowers them uh, to be resilient. So I'll give you some examples of how we've done that in some of the First Nations communities. Uh, in terms of independence, we do things like photo voice, or uh, on the right-hand side, it's called the Anishinaabe symbol-based method, where we listen to youth. We say to youth, tell us what a healthy school community means to you. Uh, two or three years ago, Ever Active Schools did a photo voice project in Kainai that led to a current project uh, focused on resilience, where they asked the youth, what does a healthy school community look like to you? They said, language, culture, history, and the land. They didn't say soda pop, exercise, Lululemon or other thing, factors like that, they pointed to their culture. And so the first thing I think schools can do would be to listen to youth and provide opportunities for them to provide feedback around what healthy schools look like to them. Mastery, here's an example where we were working with youth with type 2 diabetes. This young lady uh, came to the class every day, came to our program every day with her hair down in her eyes, did not engage with anyone, was totally removed. The only reason she was there, she got dropped off by her parents. Uh, she hated being there. And every day, every other day, we would focus on how to manage your diabetes. And we focused on diet and exercise. And it did not engage her at all. So we threw the book away and we said, let's focus on something else. And we just went up there and said, I notice you bring your drawing tablet every day or your drawing booklet every day to our group. Can you show us a drawing and teach us how to draw? Because I don't know how to draw. She went up on the board. She was scared to death. She was shaking. But she drew this beautiful flower. And all of us drew flowers. Mine's so bad, I couldn't put it up there. Um, and the next day, she came back. And her hair was pulled back. And she was sassy. And she had jokes. And this is her um, doing a grocery shop at one of our uh, indigenous common stores where they were buying groceries that they were going to cook for their family and create a meal for their family. And so by providing her with that opportunity to, to show off her skills, we engaged her in the program that we were delivering. Generosity, there are multiple health benefits associated with generosity that we've defined here. And so I'd like to go through uh, a program that we've developed and uh, we're now funded by CIHR and working with Ever Active Schools to disseminate to different First Nation communities across the country. It's called AYMP or Rec and Read. It uses indigenous teenagers who we engage as peer mentors to deliver after school programs within their community. We've published this in the journal Pediatrics. Uh, the pilot study was done in a northern isolated community called Garden Hill. Uh, it uh, is unfortunately in the news for many things like uh, lack of running water and um, various atrocities and, and increased rates of infection and things like that and diabetes. Uh, it's also on ice road truckers now because uh, it's an ice road community. But it is now starting to become uh, commonplace in the news because of some of the positive things that they're doing in the schools. So here's an example of the ice roads and what it's like when you fly into Garden Hill. Uh, here's a high school where we recruited teenagers to walk over to the elementary school and run uh, after school programs that are centered on the circle of courage. The peer mentoring prob program involves teenagers preparing healthy snacks in the upper left hand corner there and serving the youth, engaging with the children. On the bottom uh, picture, they're running games. This is Dr. Dodgeball for the youth. Um, and to the right, it's the same thing. And then up top, we bring in elders and leaders in the community to teach messages about the history of the community um, and why it's important uh, to be a role, a good role model in the community. And at the end, in terms of belonging, every, all the youth create shirts that represent the, the group that they're in, and they do a sharing circle to talk about what worked and what didn't. Um, and what we found is important health benefits. So kids who participated in that program saw reductions in their waist circumference, reductions in their body weight, and improvements in their self-esteem. And the improvement in their self-esteem led to more significant changes in their weight. But more importantly, we're seeing that more youth are getting through to grade 12. We're seeing better high school completion rates. We're seeing more students coming to class, both in the grade four 
and in the high school uh, program. We've just expanded out to five communities and we we're funded by CIHR to study that expansion. We're in Anishinaabe, Oji Cree and Cree communities right now in Manitoba. Um, here's an example of a, of a program being run in one of the Cree communities in northern Manitoba where the kids love wreck and read. Looks like there's a little more wrecking and a little less reading uh, for these grade fours because wreck is spelled a little bit incorrectly. Um, and what's really neat to see is these young children, when they first started the program four years ago, they were in grade four. When I went back to the community a few weeks ago, they came back and said, hey, I'm a mentor now. So not only is it engaging them in the program, but it's keeping them in school. And they've created their own rules that you need to be in school to participate in this program. So in terms of engagement and creating a whole school environment, we started with five mentors and about 20 youth. Last year we were at 60 mentors and almost the entire grade four, almost 100 kids, and we had to start delivering it on different days. The schools expanded it and trying to deliver it now um, in grade four, grade five, and grade six. They have so many youth volunteers that they're starting to participate in other programs like Kids in the Kitchen and volunteering their time in the other community so that the peer mentors are actively engaged in their community. The important stories that have emerged from this though are the youth saying, when I walk through the community, I have more respect for myself, I have more respect for others, and I'm more conscious of what my actions are. Whether I'm swearing, whether I'm smoking, how I'm behaving, and that's affecting uh, the entire school community. And so, currently we're, uh, we've received funding to uh, spread this program out to 13 different communities. We will be in Alberta, working with Kainai First Nation in partnership with the University of Alberta and Ever Active Schools. We'll also be in Alexander First Nation, uh, partnering with uh, Noreen Willows and Jody Kootenay, uh, who's the education director there at and the University of Alberta. So what are you going to do with this data? How are you going to create a healthy school community? So if resilience is the framework that you're going to develop your program around or develop your school around, you have to understand how your behavior influences your actions. And so I'm going to go through some quick examples here. Shifting the culture in your school. So here's a great study that was published in the journal Science that shows how your behavior and the behavior of your students are going to be affected by the environment that you create in your school. So we have two pictures on the bottom. One of them, they both have bicycles. One of them has graffiti painted, the one on the right. The other one doesn't have any graffiti. The experiment was how many people would litter. All the bikes have a little pamphlet on them, attached to them, just like when you go to uh, a shopping center and someone sticks a pamphlet in your, uh, in your windshield wiper. So at baseline, without any graffiti, 30% of the people got to their bike, took the pamphlet off, and threw it on the ground. When we spray painted the walls, that number went up to 70%. When they did the same thing in a parking garage where they had a cluttered environment that had uh, shopping carts strewn about, or shopping carts not strewn about and they had the same pamphlet stuck in the windshield. Again, 30% of people litter, but when they had uh, shopping carts everywhere, it went up to 60%. And last, they did a, a more crazy experiment where they found that uh, uh, in this community or in this city, you're not allowed to have fireworks on one day of the year. So when they blew fireworks off, people knew, hey, that's illegal, you're not supposed to do that. And sure enough, uh, when they had those, uh, the fireworks going off, the littering rates doubled again, um, showing that if you can change the environment, and this is a negative one, you will adversely affect the way people act. And so as a teacher, as a school leader, as a principal, do you have an environment where you're supporting resilience, where every teacher, every student understands the concept of resilience, and they're focusing on those four elements? And so from a positive standpoint, if you can create that, that center of resilience, that'll affect the entire school, the entire community. I have two stories that I'd like to leave you with uh, from Indigenous leaders in Manitoba. The first is Clifford Greaves. He was a runner in a very, very small town called uh, Oxford House. His first race, he won locally, then he won another, then he won a third, then he went off to Thompson to run Northern Provincial Championships. He won that. Then he went down south, and he won that. And everyone thought, you know, this is a, an amazing story of an Indigenous runner. But when you talk to Clifford, he says, my teachers, my principals, no one believed I could do it. Everyone thought, you're never going to beat those white kids. You're never going to beat those rich kids. And he said, why can't I? I won here. I can win there. And so his entire class looked to Clifford to win. 
And in the years leading up to that, graduation rates like they are in northern Manitoba were probably around 25%. And in Clifford's year, it skyrocketed to 100%. Why? When Clifford reflects on it, they saw him as a role model and they felt like if Clifford can do this, if he can overcome the adversity that we're living in here in Oxford House, maybe I can do that too. And that transitioned into all of his graduating class becoming leaders in the community. Austin Fled is the leader of the mentor program in Garden Hill. He graduated, he started in our program in grade eight, was a leader by grade 11 and 12. He's an EA in the school right now and he's getting his education degree at the University of Brandon. And when you talk to Austin, he was a keynote speaker at the Shaping the Future conference this year. He says that without the experience and the role modeling that I was allowed to have as a mentor, I never would have believed in myself to be able to get through high school and then to go on to university. And so providing these youth with those opportunities really changes uh, the environment that they're working in. So what can you do? Um, use the circle of courage in every interaction you have with a child and bring that into the culture of your school. Engage the non-engaged. So find students in your school that are isolated, that aren't engaged with other kids, that are maybe being left behind. Consider holistic models of school health promotion. Don't think of graduation simply as education. Think, in, think of it as those four elements. The more you foster those four elements, the more likely kids are going to be engaged in your school. And then finally, uh, consider the role of peer mentoring. We rely heavily on teachers and, and resource staff in the, in the schools, but think about older kids in your school and how they can help, how you can engage them in the generosity piece that might lead to a more resilient school and a more resilient school community. And so the most dangerous phrase in the English language, in my opinion, is we've always done it this way and that's how we're going to do it. And so I encourage you not to do that and to think outside the box and try to adopt some more novel interventions. This is a nice picture from one of the schools in northern Manitoba. If you think my hands are full, you should see my heart. So always believe that the youth in your school, regardless of how isolated or the social determinants of health that they're living in, regardless of how bad they are, they have a big heart and they want to give back to their community. So if we can get enough sandbags, and in my opinion, if we can start incorporating more of a resilience-based framework, uh, we can build a big enough dike and, and create more healthy school uh, environments. So I want to thank uh, the Indigenous partners that I work with in northern Manitoba, Larry Wood, uh, Mary Wood, and Elma McKay for uh, providing the groundwork for some of the data that I presented there. I work with a great group in Manitoba called the Dream Team uh, that studies diabetes and diabetes prevention. And then my own lab is uh, a wonderful team that does all the work while I go and do these presentations. So if you want to get a hold of me, johnmcgavick.com or on Twitter at johnmcgavick and email me some questions that you have. Thank you very much.